a very good evening to all of you friends uh, maybe for some of you it's good morning i'm piali your host and uh, i welcome you all to this uh, webinar today we have uh, donna jones with us from canada and donna has a very versatile experience 26 plus years of facilitating and designing organizational teams personal transformation communication leading from the moment she is an author she is a monthly blogger as well for huffington post great workplace cultures if i start talking about her it will take half of the webinar in this point only so i would not uh, take much time of yours i will just share the topic today donna will be talking about pivoting to agile leadership through decision making and now i would request donna to take care of the session over to you donna all right well thank you very much it's a friday night i so appreciate those of you that have managed to come out i know that uh, a couple of them are really early in the morning and i a big shout out to anybody in australia particularly my uh, my uh, client there so thank you for staying up late and <laughs> making this uh, making the conversation this particular conversation i aimed for thank you um i aimed it for traditional managers who've got a new role or title uh and that happens when the the, the companies that are for trying to adjust so they 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 give people new roles but they don't actually give much help on how to how to live that role out so so that's the one uh, you might be one of those people you also might be an agile coach who's working with managers in a traditional culture that's trying to become more agile and therefore survive or you might be a manager working with agile and agile's been brought into your organization and it's turning out to be a bit disruptive and so what i'm aiming to do with you in this conversation is to give you some real insight into what's going on in the dynamics and where are the openings that you can take to make a decision and shift your perspective make a different kind of decision which would lead to a different action and create uh, entirely new dynamics And I have to tell you that much of this is very subtle and it it's funny because you wouldn't expect that subtle movements would, would make a big difference but in complexity and particularly in complex systems which organizations are their communities of interaction uh subtleties are really key that's what makes it all happen so so that's uh, what I'm aiming to do for you today so I'm looking to give you some strategies some insights and some skills uh the the I've come up with 3 Cs so far I'm sure there's going to be more but for now you're 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 the witness to the 5 Cs I have for the moment context which means that it's about awareness your own self awareness what's going on globally what's going on in the environment uh the social emotional environment in your workplace uh what's going on in your community what's going on in your nation these are all a different uh similar situations where you you can see things play out and all of this the social and emotional environment drives decisions we can pretend it's intellectual and yes we can uh, love our minds and and the wonderful things our minds do but in the end the emotions really uh tell the body what what to do so that that leads us further down but that's just to say that's that's the contextual awareness the second c is conversations and much of what we're seeing in organizations is pivoting from low trust environments where you can't have many of the difficult conversations without ending up into a big blame game which is completely counterproductive uh, to more brainless friendly conversations ones that that show you you know enter into it with with a, an understanding of who we are as humans and some compassion that goes with it and I'll explain a bit about that further down the other c is coherent and this is about um the capacity to to keep your mind and your heart in balance and and of course in some organizations the idea of well, what's the heart got to do with it and the short answer is everything uh it sends information more information to your brain so then your brain sends to your heart so there's a need for emotional self regulation it's probably one of the core skills as a as a leader to be agile in the environments that you're in and that's by the way the the agile i'm using it's it's the agile in the mindset it's agile in your in your way of working with things agility in your thinking so it it covers a, a lot of things character is the next c and this is the, the question here is if you've any ever been through adversity and difficult stuff 
how did you use that? Who did you become as a result of that? Did you become someone with a higher set of ethics? Did you come up with the more, more principled approach? Um, or did you become someone who relied on, you know, more of the negative values at the, at the survival end of the spectrum? So, so these are the questions that you can ask yourself as you go. Who, who am I and who have I become through the challenges I faced? And, of course, associated with that is what do I not know about myself? What's that potential that's sitting there that right now is being uh, contained within this environment I'm in? But if I change the environment, then a whole different thing, a whole different part of me can come forward. Uh, and the fifth one for, for the purposes of today is the consciousness, which in this conversation is also mindset, and that's how you see things, how you make meaning, how you filter your perception, and, and so forth. So I'll, I'll just to give you some understanding of how I ended up uh, here with you today and, and the journey I've been on, I noticed probably 15 years ago that when I was facilitating organizational change that what was going on in companies was not keeping pace with reality. So there's these massive shifts going on in the environment. The ecological shifts are in our face today, population size, food security, energy security, all these big, big questions were sitting in the background like a screensaver in, in 15 years ago, and companies were still running around in circles, and they still do. And, and there's a reason for that, and I'll explain why. But you could go in, and I know of any consultant, and this is the value of having different perspectives, but any consultant that comes in to, that's familiar with pattern spotting will go in and go know exactly what's going to happen next because it's predictable. It's, it's driven by brain science, and unless you understand that, you're going to to stay in the rut. So it's uh, we'll get um, we'll get into that a little bit more further down the, in the conversation. So this uh, the written and you know as as, as uh, was was stated, I've written decision making for dummies, which is not exactly a dummies book. <laughs> I mean, it is under the brand, but uh, it's got a lot of sophisticated information in there, and uh, also the intelligence of the cosmos. There is a chapter in there on deep deep dynamics, which is one of my uh, favorite things to do is to perceive what's going on that nobody's paying attention to because that's what's driving the show. So in there is a conversation on self-organizing, emotion in the workplace, epigenetics, meaning what's the emotional environment and how does that impact decision making. And so that's in the book by Urban Lasso that's just been released. Now I want to talk a bit about one of the dynamics that I observed in, in the contrast between the old and the new was the evolution of cultures. And this is exactly what pretty much all of you are in the thick of in one role or another, depending on whether you're in the outside or the inside or manager or, or a agile coach or whatever your role is. And uh, this is what I decided arbitrarily to call the VUCA push, which is the volatility. I'm sure all of you have heard that term VUCA, but volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And those are pressuring traditional organizations, which I, I described on the left-hand side of this uh, diagnostic, to pushing them to drop some of the you know, rigidity and the stability, which is really what those organizations were designed to do, and shift it to something that creates higher value. And, and therefore, as you can see coming out the other side, there's higher levels of trust, higher levels of agility. Here we are having that conversation, uh, customer loyalty, and, and very patient investors, you know, investors that are both looking for the longer term as well as understanding the shorter term. So on the left-hand side, you've got very short-term driven, and on the right-hand side, you've got uh, both short and long-term. So, so that's the push. Now, what's interesting in, in my observation is the traditional companies get, they understand that they have to change. Of course, the big question is how, and so this is where Agile comes in because, like, oh, let's let's introduce Agile, and they, the, you know, the, the idea is to introduce Agile, but without the what I'm going to call the consciousness, without the awareness of what happens when you throw in a different worldview and and have it collide with a very, uh, you know, a, a, another worldview, completely different one. So there's tension being created in these companies that is unnecessary. It creates a lot of uh, and, you know, some, some negative emotions, which are difficult and also have the effect of compromising decision making. So I'm just going to give you, this is not the best graphic I've ever come up with, but uh, I at least will give you an idea of what these tensions come from. So the thinking in a traditional environment is very linear analytical. It's looking for the problem solving. Let's fix the root cause. 
but you're in a complex adaptive system. There is no root cause. There are multiple points where you can take action and have a systemic effect. So the you know that's the the, the agility in the thinking is recognizing that it's moving. You're going to use linear analytical for some things, but for the most part, when you're working with business culture, you're looking at a systemic, uh, total worldview, a larger, much larger, uh, broader perspective. Uh, and with that, and of course, related to that is that with a linear business process, there's a lot of money being thrown out the uh, out the end of the pipe. So with a systemic process, you can actually see what's going on. It's a much bigger picture and a much more effective decisions going on. The focus in traditional is on profit, believing that companies are profit-making machines. The focus in, uh, in, in, in an agile world or in a wider world is on purpose, where purpose drives profit. And it's not just a mini purpose, like uh, it's, a, it's a very high purpose. Uh, Novo Nordisk, good example, their higher purpose is to create systemic health. That's, that's very high. And there are others that are really good exemplars. There have been companies that have been around for a while that are exemplars that uh, demonstrate this. From a leadership point of view, it's the traditional view is leadership is tied to authority. From an agile point of view, it's tied to self and collective leadership. So it's much more of a self-organizing approach, much, much more autonomy, much more freedom for contribution when done well. In the relationships with power, uh, which is always an interesting dynamic, there is the, di the difference is traditional has, has always rewarded power over others, whereas now it's more about power with others because that's we need everybody. I mean, these problems are big and, and we need everybody to work together. So that's the, the push toward that. Uh, the, the notion in terms of change and assumption is that we can engineer outcomes. In other words, change was predictable and it's anything but uh, in today's world. So what you're doing then is shifting the mindset to, to look at it through the lens of I'm going to work with shows with, with what emerges and not try to control it. And it's not all of these are mastery level skills. There's nothing light about this. This takes uh, much more of you to to become um, you know, strong with in, in terms of mastery. Organizationally, traditional organizations were designed for stability, so they really don't like innovation. They're not built for it, and, and it's, it's quite annoying. And that's why you'll have big organizations like GM that have a cell, uh, you know, an innovation cell, and everybody, you know. So, and now it's also why big organizations are buying their innovation. They're buying innovative startups and B Corps and, and, and this kind of, that to try and get around that, uh, that issue. So the, this is the sort of a big world view, and the bottom line is when you have cognitive flexibility and relation, relational, relationship flexibility, you're obviously going to create far better decisions given the process. Now, <laughs> fundamentally, we're still cavemen. Uh, we, we still have this business of responding to unfamiliar things in as a threat. So everybody's, this is not, this is not uh, unique to anybody. It, it, sorry, it's, it's, it's the same for everybody. We're, we're human. And that means that we have, there's a, when you have uncertainty in low trust environments, you're going to treat it as a threat. When you're entering into low familiar, unfamiliar environments, there's a low safety threshold and you're going to enter it into a, you know, you're going to sense it as a threat. So the opportunity for both agile coaches and for managers who are in an agile environment is to, in other words, both of you can take on an agile response, which is to say, let's make it safe to experiment, not pilot anything. That's the old, you know, the old language is changed. Like we're moving into a new, more specific language. So make it safe to experiment because that way we can build some, some familiarity. We can start moving into these, this new territory called agile uh, with, with a, a, a building confidence as we go. And so, because otherwise what the tension that gets created is, is uh, it, it basically ends up being um, an unfortunate business of I'm going to stick to my old way and the, the other new thing comes in and it's the, uh, the weird kid on the, on the block, so to speak. So I'm going to give you three different evolutions that go with that. Um, and, and, you know, these are, I made these up. So you may say, oh, hey, you know, there's another version of this. That's fine. Uh, it's just a way of looking at it. So the first one would say traditional mindset meets agile. And, and that interpretation from a brain science point of view is agile is a threat to stability. We've got to manage uncertainty. I even heard at a recent uh, event in London that the idea is to manage disruption, which is 
uh, fascinating. I'm not quite sure how you go about doing that. So, so, but it's that idea. We need to control it somehow. And of course, the idea that that we have to hang on to the control and that we're afraid of letting it go, it just creates enormous stress for the individual. And and of course, that spreads to the organization. So I'm going to suggest that the next level up is to open up a bit and say, well, let's, yeah, I'm still inclined to do some tell and sell and still trying to control behavior, but let's open it up a bit and, and try something else and do it together. So most people are willing to try it if their personal risk is low in terms of their reputational risk, their safety, uh, and so forth. So, so psychological safety, emotional safety. So try, try things out, but the goal here always has to be bigger than yourself because otherwise it's something that you just, it, there's not enough desire to let go of control in order to experience something else. So this is where the leadership side of it really steps forward from a decision-making point of view. And find the highest level, and of course there's a bunch in between, I, I know, but, but the highest level is to learn, lead from the emerging moment, which is about really having multiple points of focus simultaneously seeing the dynamics, deep, deep dynamics, being able to conduct those quality conversations uh, and difficult conversations, because that's where you can use diversity to greatest effect. It's where you can use diversity of opinion, diversity of, of perspective, uh, diversity of thought, all those things you can have when you've got the capacity to hold the space of higher trust and transparency and autonomy, and yet uh, respect being a fundamental core aspect to that. So I'm going to just put the question out, if I may, and, and that is to ask you, uh, what do you see as being the advantage of making the move, leadership move, no matter what your role is, what's the advantage of making that move out of a fixed frame, you know, which you, where, you, where you notice your mind is really rigidly focused, to a more agile way of leading yourself and others? And I'm just going to ask if we can get any uh, questions around that or observations. That would be great. Uh, I have a question here. Uh, how to convince executives for a buy-in for Agile where there is apprehension? Apprehension. Yeah. Well, if there's apprehension, you already know you've hit the cave brain. <laughs> yeah. It's a threat. Uh, and, 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 of course, the interesting things about threats is that if you rely on telling them or selling them, you're using a command and control mindset to try and convince them to come in other words, it's a duplication of what you're trying to actually replace in the organization. So this is where you're noticing your observation of, of saying, wow, interesting. If there's apprehension, then what you can do is say, well, look, what would, be, what would make it safe enough, for, safe enough for us to try this out together? It, put the problem in front of you both rather than making it uh, it's, it's executive versus agile. It is, it's actually mutually beneficial, but it's rarely positioned like that. So if you can take it and put the, the problem and say, this is something we'd like to do, we're gonna need your help to do it, uh, what will make it safe enough for us both to try it out together in the relationship and see how it goes, and, and then let's, let's try that out. So I hope that answers, gives you some ideas. Yeah, we have uh, like another question here. How to convince uh, senior management to move to Agile? You know, it's interesting because, first of all, I'm not sure you convince them of anything. If their mind's made up, uh, trying to convince them will only make their minds firmer. And the reason for that is that they are operating off of a belief, and I'll be talking about beliefs next. But when they operate off of a belief, and you probably noticed this in politics, facts have nothing to do with it. <laughs> uh, you, you can sell them on the benefits, you can give them all of that, but they have, it has nothing to do with it. But if you, if you can reposition it and think about it in terms of, of creating a reputational value, keep in mind that most, most executives are very keen on, uh, they operate, there's a level of ego involved, and let's not, let's not dance around that, there is a, a level of ego involved, and, and they want their reputation to be pretty pretty darn fantastic. So uh, if you can position Agile around the opportunity to make a real reputational difference in the community or whatever, wherever the uh, uh, market is, the audiences that you, you're, you're influencing, that will help because you're, you're looking at 
uh, positioning it both for self-interest but also larger interest. It's, it's taking those two points together and and putting them together and, and saying, um, you know, this this is this is the opportunity for us to to start moving. The reality is, you've probably noticed this, but the reality is that the pressure that these executives are under right now is massive, and it gets worse the more they resist. The, uh, the more they resist the, uh, the move the, you know, to, to shift, it gets much more difficult. And so if, if you're able to, to sort of come, come to them with, with a, a, an approach that lets them do small steps, uh, low risk, but, but an opportunity to, to move toward things step by step, uh, I think you'll get further than you would just trying to go in and sell and yell or, you know, or try and convince them that it's a great idea and, and uh, because from their point of view, it's not. It's a, it's a threat and, and, uh, and a risk to um, their reputation. And it's funny because I, I had something recently happen where it, which pointed this out, which is um, I, was, I was talking about introducing a, a virtual reality uh, online offline organizational transformation program that we would co-design with the, with the company. And the manager said to me, so it's new. I said, yep, it's new. It's never been done. He said, so that means I can't fail. Yeah, exactly. So you can, if you can position the conversation around, there, you know, it, this, is a, this is not, you can't fail at this. You can, you can learn. We can all learn, but we can't fail. So you can see that where the apprehension is coming from intuitively, very intuitive approach, obviously. Uh, you can see where the apprehension is coming from, and that's what you you work directly with, so that you can create a, a path of ease for for these executives. That and the older ones are obviously looking for their pension and to uh, move forward with a different kind of life. But uh, you've got a real opportunity with with um, those who are I would say less than sixty. So I hope that helps. Yep. Uh, moving on to the next question we have. Uh, should the leadership move out to agile way of leading before the teams move? Yeah, this is one of those chicken and egg kind of questions. Um, it's, it's a really good question. I think it's going to depend on the organization. I don't think there's any linear uh, logical uh, formula for this. I think uh, sometimes teams can il illustrate to executives what it's like. You know, if you can master it at the team level or, or even get pretty good at it or good enough that you can say to the executive, hey, we'd like you to come in and see how we're working. Uh, we'd like your input or whatever invitation uh, feels right. But but I, I think you can work it both ways because I, I think sometimes if, if, if the executive are resistant to to coming into the agile environment, making it, I, used to, I think of it as a golden bridge. You create this lovely bridge of invitation and it's, it's low risk. Um, it's a friendly environment. You know, come in and join us for coffee. Watch how we work. Uh, so there's no big test for them. They don't have to uh, control anything. They don't. It's just an opportunity to come in and be social. Even that. So it's it's making that the crossing of the bridge quite friendly. And and you may find in some instances you've got agile. You've got an executive who are actually pretty progressive and willing to say, yeah, we want to learn more about this. Uh, in which case, obviously, run with that, but it's not that common. So, if it's there, go for it. Um, but don't. I would. I would really caution against anything that that sounds like first we do this, then we do this. That's very linear, logical. And when you're working with systems change, uh, not, there's nothing terribly logical about it apart from what what it is to be human. Anything else, and then I'll move on. Uh, yes, uh, we have a few questions here, but uh, the last one I'm taking now because uh, for the time boxing of things, uh, we have a question: Is there any specific metrics for executives to convince them on growth mindset? Yeah, um, actually, there there are quite a few. Uh, Carol Dweck has done. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of her. The psychology of um, Mindset, I think is the name of the book. So she's got, and there's a TED talk on that. And sometimes a TED talk is a great way to do it, by the way. You could just send a link to the to the TED talk. But there's also some research that she's done on, on that and, and the metrics around resilience as well. Uh, so, so that's one reference point. Um, the other person that's, she doesn't use the word growth mindset. Uh, Carol does because that's her, she has a psychological framework she uses. 
But uh, Jane McGonigal, with who wrote Reality is Broken, she's a game game designer, and uh, I've been looking because I've been looking at games to have more fun with transformation instead of making it uh, hard and difficult. But let's have fun with it and bring out play as the vehicle for transforming organizations. Jane has done enormous amount of research into what she calls the difference between a threat, which is the cave brain, and a challenge environment, which says, can we do this? This is exciting, you know, seeing it as an opportunity to really take on a, a challenge together. And so she's got a lot of research on that. Um, I think the website is called, Are you, well, no, one of the websites is called Are You Gameful? And then the other one is called Show Me the Science. So I'm pretty sure if you Google either one of those, uh, the, the Are You Gameful is a set of inventories that uh, different ones that she's put, compiled that allow you to go in and say, hey, where are my skills at with respect to resilience? And it's a self-assessment, so you don't, it's not a big test or anything. You don't, uh, you know, it's not, you don't get an A, B, or C, or D, or any of those kinds of things. You, you just kind of use it to self-manage and, and lead yourself through, through uh, growing in that process. And then the uh, Show Me the Science has got a lot more of the serious scientific data that um, has to do with and a lot of stuff around health, which is, you know, most organizations are really struggling with mental health and stress, and that's simply because they're not adapting. So thank you for those questions. Um, if it's all right, I'll keep going, and then we'll, we'll have another couple of stops, I uh, hope, along the way. Does that work? Yes, yes, that, that's fine. And rest of the questions, we can take uh, care offline. Yeah. Okay, so so what uh, what I've been talking about then is is this shift between uh, the command and control mindset, which is or the traditional view of the organization, which is a, a very narrow focus. It, it, as I said earlier, the focus is on profit, and the idea is uh, there's always a boss. Now, honestly, you can find bosses in six company employee six you know employee companies. You can have a small company with a tyrant as a boss. And you can equally have a large company with a very old-fashioned uh, mindset. And in this case, old-fashioned is not a good thing because there's just no agility in, in the capacity to handle what's going on in the world today. So that's why I say these are much more advanced skills. You have to, as a leader, bring in more self-awareness, more capacity to kind of recognize, like, whoa, I just, I just blew that executive up. That that was not my plan. What did I do that I could have done differently? And so you spend some time with a retrospective with yourself on what happened there and how can I approach it and try. So keep it. There's a lot of experimentation involved as you make the, the, the switch yourself because you've heard me in these answers say, well, if you go in with, if you've got a, a tell, sell, yell, uh, you know, command and control style culture and you go in and you try and tell, sell, something that's supposed to be very agile and, and uh, autonomous and have all those, those beautiful qualities of, of self-organizing, then you're running and you're putting those two things head to head and it's going to blow up. So if you, you have to be much more strategic and, and much more um, compassionate with, with who we are as people and particularly you need to know the brain science. It, it, and I don't by that I'm saying you don't need a course in it. We, we just talked about it. If you can recognize when the cave brain is showing up, you can pivot in the moment. So, so now VUCA, I think the important thing also is this VUCA changes company purpose and it changes it because you, you, if you were just profit focused, you burn out the ecological resources and you'll see when in my last slide what, what's happened and I know you know what looks like if you're in India, I know not all of you are, but if you're in India, there's, you know, it's the air pollution. It's all these kinds of things that happen when you're profit focused. And so you completely ignore everything that doesn't look like it adds up to money. And so that includes, quite often that includes looking after people, which is quite bizarre when you think about it. So the shift is from company, from profit focused to quality of life focused. And that is a much higher calling as an organization. It's a higher calling for leaders. And it's it's a higher calling in terms of how you make your decisions and what things you take into account. If you're if you're just looking at profit, it's simple. You're looking at one half of the balance sheet. But if you're looking at quality of life, you're looking at many much more of the picture. You're looking at you know how how is this working for the social environment internally? What are the implications for the planet? Right now, companies that are profit focused are throwing money out a lot of money out, and now we're having to figure out how to retrieve that. So. So that's a, a very big opportunity 
for if you're depending on what kind of company you're in depending on what stage of evolution it's in if you can see opportunities to broaden the part the purpose and to move it out of this entrenched belief that it's all about the money and that quality of life doesn't matter you're going to be well on your way to helping your company actually th get through this next set of exponential change which is massive so what I'm saying is that in this process, the changes to decision making and leadership, you're, you're, you're always going to be responding to exponential changes. And as long as you've got this pressure to hold back and stay, keep yourself, you know, hold your talent back and, and not move it forward, it's the, the pressure is going to be too much. So we've got a wider calling in, in terms of global health to help us each adapt more resiliently to handle these exponential changes, not in a fearful way, but as a positive, as a challenge, as a way to step up and, and really get better at, at being um, who we are and in particularly in, in who we are in relationship with, with each other. So now I'm going to show you exactly what happens when you have someone, uh, this is from a colleague of mine, uh, Jay Bragdon, he's got an investment index, it's really interesting. Uh, what he's done, this is a model he drew, the traditional model of the firm. And the further down you go, the bottom is the leverage point for transforming firms. And, and if you're in an agile environment, uh, you're coming in at the structural level or the behavioral level. And, and so that's, that's the level that you're, you're, you're entering into. But what you're going to run into smack on are the beliefs. So, and because these, these beliefs have a tendency to drive everything. So I have a colleague who put together a, a program that benefited uh, people in the company and when he went to go and get it renewed he put in a proposal for two million dollar savings now you think that a company that is profit oriented would say yes to money but no they said no and why did they say no well because capital assets have more value than people in nature that's the belief now it's not just the manager that said that it's the company so if you took that manager out of that context he or she would say uh, something else completely different but in that context that's the prevailing belief so we've got to treat you know start to orchestrate a shift from limiting beliefs to values-based decision-making that's a massive pivot and it's a critical one and it, it when it fails it fails because there's an inability to differentiate between what's a belief and what's a value so I'm going to do that next that's the next question one of the beliefs if you're listening to the organization if you just try suspend your mental processing just go in and listen to the organization you'll hear you'll hear beliefs agile was going to cause me to lose control i'm afraid of losing or you'll see the behaviors that will show that same behavior beliefs may or may not be true but they give you something to lean on in the moment especially when something unfortunate like something new shows up a disruption shows up values on the other hand transcend and i chose this picture because i happen to know that it, assuming that many of you are from most of you are from India there is you know high value uh, around family and so family values transcend they, they, they focus on what's important but they transcend all else and in personal decision it would boil down to you know do I go to my daughter's concert or the office well if you're if you believe that if you don't go to the office you're gonna get fired clearly you'll go to the office but if you value family, you're going to go to the daughter's concert. Those are the that's how it works in in a personal at a personal level. <laughs> um, I was at a green investment forum quite a long time ago, and uh, I happened to be talking to the probably great great maybe next or great grandfather of Henry Ford and uh, grandson I should say of Henry Ford, and he was telling me that when the Model T was first introduced. The, the, the belief was, and you can also hear it as a fear, but the belief was that you, you got in that car and at 60 kilometers per hour, this is, the, the dog's face would be what you look like. Uh, in other words, it, the speed would distort your human features and you would look like this poor dog does forever. It would never go back. So, so this is where it gets kind of entertaining because some of our beliefs are actually pretty, pretty funny. So it's a chance to kind of get some distance and look at ourselves and go, we're pretty funny as a species sometimes. But that's what they do. Beliefs make sense out of experience, uh, out of past experience, 
and they make sense out of the unfamiliar. So this is why organizations will go into ruts because they're running their decisions through. This is where we've been. This is where we've always done it. This is how we've always done it. And, and so they'll keep on that cycle because it's nice and safe and it's familiar. And that is why your leadership is critical at this point in time. So the core question that you're asking yourself is, what is the purpose of these beliefs? Is it limiting or inspiring beliefs? Because beliefs are not good or bad. They're either going to be serving a purpose to be limiting people or inspiring people. And Henry Ford said it when he said, you know, when you think you, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. Whether you believe you can or you believe you can't, you're right. It's, it's that idea. So you can use that idea, that notion of this, what is this limiting or inspiring to sort out whether your beliefs were hanging on or not. Uh, limiting beliefs have what I call the hamster effect. Uh, that's these little guys here. So they, they've been uh, running around in circles really hard, and uh, they realize they're in exactly the same place they were before. So a lot of organizations are experiencing that sensation because they're, they're still in those ruts. So that's a sensation that if you're inside a company and you have this feeling that you go to work every day and you work really hard and you end up in exactly the same place, then chances are it's because your organization is running entirely off of a limiting set of beliefs and that's a really high leverage point for change and therefore your leadership, obviously. So this is the more organic model of the firm and the beliefs in this model are people and nature are more important than capital assets. Uh, harmony with living systems is key to prosperity. And so you can see a very different shift in this, in this uh, model that Jay has put together, uh, Joseph is really his name, and he's just written a book called, we published a book called um, Companies That Mimic Life, and he's described it as a renaissance because the companies he profiles are companies that have been around for many, you know years, like long time. The ones that, most of those companies that didn't model their management style off of nature have died, and they're, they're companies that have closed and crashed, but these companies have learned how to be agile, they've learned how to think uh, like a living system and, and lead like one. And so uh, that's, in it. That's, that's just something to keep in mind as a reference point in, in your own observations. So if you looked at what beliefs drive decisions in your place or what beliefs drive decisions toward agile, what attitudes towards agile, uh, what, what do you get? And I, I don't think I'll stop here to take that question. I think we'll, I'll keep going and, and then we'll have space at the end for more. But it's a question that I'm asking to, to give you a, 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 a means to sort of go into your organizations and watch what, what's going on. Just observe, non-judgmental. There's no point in putting blame or anything on it, just saying what's going on here and, and wow, this is interesting. So it's kind of like how, if, you, if you pretend you're a drone and you're flying over uh, the organizational conversations in your workplace, what beliefs do you see running? at work and, and that will give you a lot more to work with a lot more clarity to work with to be able to know okay this is why they're looking at agile the way they are uh, and that's so we need, I need to have the, the conversation facts won't change it you can try them but it, it doesn't necessarily <coughs> excuse me going to help it might it might but generally I just did a well I'm going to speak about that in a moment but the more reasons you, you know the more kind of understanding you can bring in without confronting people, the better it is, obviously. So in your decision making or in your leadership aspect, uh, one of the biggest uh, focal point, the biggest, this is like this word focus has got so many layers to it. So I'm only going to tackle one layer today. Uh, there's a lot of layers in this from a leadership point of view and an organizational point of view. But if you can maintain awareness of what is the focus is on what's going on uh, it, it it's if, if people are focused on being perfect for example then there's absolutely no space for learning or innovation because everything has to be certain and perfect and it will not it's going to be difficult that's the simple aspect of it so these are the places where there's a willingness to let go a willingness to say okay it doesn't have to be perfect we just need, need to be able it just needs to be good enough to try and we can have a try at that so those are the places where you can use this to get um, uh, get insight. 
Yeah, let's just leave it at that. There's a whole lot more. I'm going to give you the Ford Taurus story because one of my colleagues, when I was involved in the uh, Knowledge and Innovation Network, uh, one of my colleagues told me the story around the campfire. We were sitting down in Arizona having conversations about organizational design. This was back in 2007 and eight, And uh, he told me the story about Lou Veraldi and Ford. And Lou, Lou Veraldi uh, was one of the first project program managers in Ford, and what, what Ford had always done was focus on engineering goals like cost, weight, and durability. Those are internal goals. So that's they'd always done that. And when he came in, he he thought um, he broke people um, across the function. So he he did interdisciplinary uh, teams. He made across the functions, and it, and he made it a cohesive team because so and because he wanted to make the Taurus the car a commercial success, he he changed the conversation redirected it from toward the customer's experience so he, he would say to the engineers tell me something about this design you're proud of and then the engineer would report on the electrical output of the alternator or some uh, aspect like that and and then he would ask the engineer well how's that going to affect the total experience of the car for the customer and according to my colleague that line of questioning led to all sorts of innovation engineering innovations. So it seems like a subtle shift, but it makes a big difference to what decisions get made and, and how they are made. So that's an example of, of how you can use uh, uh, focus. You know, how do you shift focus by taking one point and adding another point? And I'll just give you uh, uh, an example. There's two more examples here. So what you're doing then in, in, in your conversations with your executives, or in your conversations is to take a merge an internal goal, what's something we're trying to accomplish internally with an external reference point. So uh, the first example, how would this feature affect or improve the customer experience? Inside goal, outside reference. So there's a connection made between these two points. Similarly, the question that I put in here is from Novo Nordisk, a challenge they gave their employees in 2004. And that question was, how can we save energy and increase profits while investing in renewable energy so these are not cut costs questions these are curiosity based questions they are invitational questions and that is where the innovations come from and they're very brain friendly so that is the if you're going to an executive you you know and you have something that you want to pitch to them you might consider framing it up in this kind of way where you know you're looking at here's here's what we're trying to accomplish we're trying to we're 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 asking ourselves this question and we believe the answer is you know we'll do this this and this so it's just to give you a way to strategically present the questions that your project or your program or whatever it is you're working on can can be heard uh, through that lens of of a traditional uh, brain. So redirecting then the focus from a single point to multiple points has the effect of inspiring if you use the right word. I just finished, actually, I went, I published it today. Uh, I did an interview with a, uh, uh, someone from the Beyond Budgeting Roundtable, but she, she's, her company is an energy company, and she had implemented, in her company, she had removed budgeting from the business process. It, it just wasn't serving them. So, and she explains in there, by the way, how she, uh, what four reasons she tabled with the board for getting rid of the budget. So they, and, and when they got rid of the budget, what they found was with the budget, they were looking at backwards 80% of the time and 20% of the time they were looking forward. When they got rid of the budget, it switched focus from looking back to looking forward. So meaning 20% of the time they look back now, but 80% of the time they're looking forward. And we're in the environment, it's a very heads up environment. You cannot be looking backward. You, you're gonna get smoked by these changes that are the innovations that are underway. So you may, I encourage you to listen to that. The uh, website is the, on there. Um, but uh, that conversation we had is really wonderful and lots of ideas in there for you. I talk a lot about energy because that's how I perceive the dynamics. And uh, just so you know, it's not woo woo and people don't get all all freaked out about it. Energy and physics is the ability to do work. Uh, it's also what gets you up in the morning. So if you're adamant that energy is uh, woo-woo, then I don't know how you get up in the morning. So I just wanted to give that definition because the next principle is one that is really, 
really effective for observing dynamics. Uh, that is energy flows where attention goes. So when you, Agile is introduced to a traditionally managed company, what happens? Now management and Agileists can look at this and say, what's going on? on in our company? What are we seeing as a result of introducing this different approach? What's going on? You know, how are things playing out? And that's a way of doing it uh, together to sort of say, look, if we can make, if we can approach this more um, from a higher view, then you use that principle and it's, it really helps you see where people's uh, energy, emotional energy is going, where the social energy is going, are more things getting done around the water cooler than at the desk or wherever they're supposed to be getting done. So that's a principle that works everywhere. Teams, organizations, you can apply it just everywhere you go. So it's, it's quite handy, quite, fle quite flexible. Related to that is that when you watch those dynamics, you will see what everyone calls resistance to change. Oh, they're resistant to change. Well, they're not resistant. Nobody's resistant to change unless it's unsafe to change. So if, if you have, you're seeing resistance, it's because fundamental human needs are not being addressed. It's because questions around, am I, you know, what's going on? What does this mean to me? Am I going to be, you know, secure financially? How am I feeling about this? Am I being involved in how it takes place? Was I involved in the decision initially? Uh, and, and who is impacted, who, you know, who's involved in this decision and how? If you can, if you can you know, use that, think of that when you're communicating about Agile to management and management when you're communicating about Agile to everyone else, if you can remember that, that really we're fundamentally human and the only way resistance to change is, is happening is simply because we've not remembered that. So you're going to have places where things get rough. It's going to be not that much fun in places. And this is where you pull out of the difficulty and you look from, you pivot perspective. You, you, it's a decision. I say it's a leadership decision because it's, there's a point of awareness where you go, eesh, I'm not feeling good about this at all. Uh, I'm stressed out. I'm grumpy with my family. Uh, my relationships are being affected in a negative way. I need to do something. And the easiest thing you can do is pull out, preferably be in nature if you can find that. Certainly in India, there's lots of places because I've been to India, so I, I've found some wonderful places there. But idea being that you pull out and see the dynamics from a distance. See yourself in the dynamics from a distance. And that it gives you the chance to get your fears on the table, address them directly, and not let them run the show, because they do run the show if you don't address them. And it also allows you to initiate, uh, oops, I spelled that wrong, sorry. Initiate higher quality conversations as well. And that's with yourself, you know, what am I feeling? How am I uh, doing with this? And, and what, what can I change, you know, to, to, to be better with what's going on? And also at a team level, and then, of course, at an organizational level. So these things scale very nicely. I hope that uh, gives some ideas there. And essentially, um, yeah, okay. So this, <laughs> uh, this is the other area. This is the coherence part. Now, people wonder what I mean by that. Uh, how many of you, I'm just going to ask this rhetorically for now, but how many of you have been in a situation where you've heard mixed messages? where you've heard one thing and felt another. You thought, you know, I hear this, but it doesn't quite feel right. Well, this is where the mind is saying one thing, but the heart, how you feel about it, is happening at another level. And so unless you, you know, part of this leadership challenge that's ahead and the agility around it is being aware of when am I coming from my mind? And that, by the way, as soon as you start thinking sell, tell, and yell, or buy it, that's a mind thing. So if you can bring it, balance it better with the heart, and then match your vocabulary to fit the two, uh, you're well on your way. Now I want you to feel, I want you to see exactly how powerful this is, because uh, our bodies, and some of you may not find this information uh, acceptable, but that's okay. I, I don't mind with that. But the point is that you're automatically taking it in because you're, you know, we are sensory creatures. We take in information from all sources, uh, both from information into our mind, but also from feelings in the environment. So there is a brain-body coherence that we're going to play with right now. So here we go. <laughs> this is always fun. Uh, what I want you to do is take your right foot 
And in your, you know, be, be preferably sitting down with this. I, I'm not, if you're standing up, you need to lean against the wall. But if you're sitting down, just take your right foot and do circular clockwise motion. So do circular clockwise motion. And with your right hand, draw the number six. And see what you see. What do you observe? And I can't actually find out from you, which I prefer to do if I'm in the room with you and we're playing with this. Uh, uh, but but at least uh, you get the instinct. I hope you get the sense that there's some wiring that goes on in our bodies already that are asking for coherence. And so one of the opportunities as an ad, as an uh, in the agile leadership domain is to be very aware of how much you bring to the work you do. It's not just you don't walk. You're not a walking head. You've got so much more that you bring in. And so this uh, business of coherence is part of it. These questions I pulled from conversational Judith Jet Blazer. It was a handout she gave on coaching questions. They're very good. And there's a whole uh, support page from them. I'm not even sure if she's published it online. But I pulled these out because uh, they were good questions that you could use for specific situations, the kind of questions is, is what, I, what I'm pointing out here. These are the kinds of questions that are brain friendly. They shouldn't be threatening to your executive or any, you know. So if you use this kind of language and you approach it in this way, both for discovery or innovation, uh, I think you'll get a lot further than you will if you try and sell or tell. That's what I'm saying around that, so. And the next massive opportunity that you all have is to, as I said earlier, to do the pivoting. Uh, this is a picture of, um, of Delhi and the smog. And obviously, we can't keep doing this. We can't. So the opportunity is to pivot the company's purpose to much higher goal, to benefit, to become what, what is now known as agents of world benefit to benefit your communities, to benefit uh, quality of life, it goes back to what I was saying earlier. And I just pulled this out of some research that I saw that, um, you, you know, in terms of companies, if you're if you're in a company and working for a company, uh, anything clean energy sources, uh, wind and solar would would help with food security. So lots of lots of opportunity here to shift and pivot how a company Company, what the rule business plays, but particularly the company in, in terms of what it's doing to make it far more profitable and far more prosperous, but at the same time, more importantly, making a much bigger difference. And this is my quote that I've been using since time began. I, I truly believe this. It's uh, we have some massive challenges ahead of us, uh, 8 billion, 7, 7, 7 billion people on the planet. We have a lot, a lot of things to do, and we can only do that by working together. Everybody needs to work together, both inside uh, the organization, and from the inside and from the outside, to bring to it the awareness and the focus that will allow us to make the decisions collectively and individually that can shift things to a much healthier state than we currently have. And, and I'm not going to mince words on this. It does take courage. So <laughs> we invite you to consider which superhero costume you would like because this is the opportunity that's in front is to um, is to think of yourself as, as that not from an ego place obviously but from an inspirational place and, and a driven from a higher sense of purpose so now I'm going to ask for questions observations any collisions that took place in the words I gave uh, and I'm just going to leave my contact information up for you and then go to you to um, Hear what questions you have, and uh, invite you at the same time to uh, reach out for any collaborations that you you have in mind that you think would be fun to do, and and some creative ways of approaching things because that's I think what we need to do more than ever. So go ahead and uh, let's hear some questions. Yeah, the first question I can see here. Do we have statistics of how many companies as percent? have gone agile as of today, uh, worldwide and USA? I do not have those numbers. Um, I know that if you look at some of the organizations like Scrum Alliance, I, I have, I'm on a, 
we have weekly conversations with Steve Denning, and uh, I can ask Steve that question. Uh, I don't know. I do know that we have research on the values of countries worldwide, um, 169 countries, what are their values, and that has an impact on how those decisions get made. But, uh, and I also know that there's a, a I think uh, Scrum Alliance was getting 4,000 new members a month for, this was several years ago when I did a webinar with them and, um, and with Steve Denning. And uh, yeah, it's, um, it was a massive number. So I think the, the, go, the go, Agile is currently the go-to solution, uh, but with it comes some challenges and that's where the, the awareness is required. Okay, next question we have, uh, how can this be implemented, especially in startups, uh, where there are less number of people and no Agile coach? Well, I think, gosh, you've got such a variety of governance models to draw from. And, and, and I can tell you it's a human thing to drift to hierarchy. So, you know, if, if you take a look at, I, on my web page, uh, one of my web pages on the, from insight to action.com, I have a list of the podcasts I've done on self-managed companies. And I would encourage you to just do some homework on, on those, what, you know, liquid. I'm working with Cocoon Projects next week. Uh, they have designed something called Liquid Organizations, uh, Liquid O. So if you Google Cocoon Pro, Liquid O, uh, you will get a white paper on how they've designed it. And they have designed an agile governance model. That is that is their design. But I also have a whole bunch of other, about 11 or 12 interviews with different models to, to look at. Uh, some of them, as you probably have heard, Holacracy, for example, it is strictly a governance model. It doesn't handle the social side and you have to come to terms with that. But there are others that have structure plus the social built in. Liquid O is one of them, uh, but there's a whole lot of other self-management institute, Morningstar, Doug Kirkpatrick, he's speaking in Milan next week. And uh, so there's a lot of examples and I would encourage you to do quite a bit of homework on that and then, and then start to think through what are the values that anchor us together? How will we apply them to our decisions? When you have tensions, know that those tensions work for you, not against you, but you have to put them on the table. You can't run away from them. You can't pretend that they're not there. Otherwise, they build and it turns into a, a big explosion, which isn't useful. So you're really looking at being very attentive to people's needs, but at the same time, looking at structures that support that kind of self-organizing framework. There's a lot more accountability and responsibility in self-organizing than there is in the command and control environment. Okay, moving on to the next question. Uh, does Agile manager need to equip technical skills? I don't know if I'm, I'm equipped to answer that. I think that it's possible to do, to, to, I mean, I'm just going to give you my observation, but I, I don't know that I'm, uh, I'm the right person to ask that. I, I think it's possible to do both. I mean, certainly when I listen to my colleagues who are steeped in the technical side, are quite capable of having one foot in both worlds, but I don't think that's necessarily a, a, a given. I, I think that it's going to depend a bit on the person's capacity to uh, move from one mindset to another to shift and, and be able to see to you know, expand their brain quite a bit. So I don't think there's a single answer to that. I think it's going to be a, it depends on the person, but that's you know that's just my observation. So. Okay, so that's all we have, the questions. Great. Well, thank you. My gosh, thank you very much, every one of you, for coming out on a Friday night. Thank you for your questions. And I hope I was able to give you some value in this conversation in this, in the, in this, and, and that uh, I look forward to seeing you on LinkedIn or on the podcast or whatever, on Twitter, whatever way it works, I look forward to, to seeing you. And I, I do welcome any conversations to explore collaborations. That'd be a lot of fun. So thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Donna, for your time and this uh, wonderful session. A few more information about the session, friends. Uh, attending this webinar earns you one SCU under category A and uh, one leadership PDU. And all this information we will post on our discussion forum on a single thread and we will share the thread with all of you. Another thing, uh, 
people from India, especially from Bangalore. The annual conference of Discus Agile Network is uh, scheduled on December 15th and 16th. It will be a multi-theme conference. We have four themes this year, Kanban, Hybrid Agile, Personal Agility, and Coaching and Leadership. And yes, uh, this conference will also give you 16 SEUs under Category A. You can check all the details on our website, discussagile.com. So these are the few informations from my side. And once again, thanks all of you. Thanks for joining. Good night. Thanks for your help. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Donna.